Yeah. This is Geek Therapy Radio. What are we waiting for? And now your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. Welcome to Geek Therapy Radio. I am your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. Make sure you're liking and following and subscribing to all of Geek Ther- Therapy Radio across all social media. Just search tickety tickety tick geek therapy radio there and twitter and instagram and facebook and youtube and i'll be right there let's move right into it um first i'll say in the second segment here we're going to talk about starbucks and sex and pornography so you're going to want to stick around for that it's very interesting but in this first segment let's talk about batteries I have often mentioned on this show that one of the biggest factors holding back the advance of technology uh, besides the slowing down of Moore's Law is the lack of rapid advancements in the storage of electricity. For the most part, battery density, at least for the mainstream, has more or less plateaued over recent years with only incremental uh, advancements. Uh, For instance, in an example I have often used, one of my biggest complaints about smartwatches Uh, has been battery life. Now, I love smart watches. It's very Dick Tracy. I love my Samsung Gear S2, and I have often lamented uh, over Pebble's demise. Pebble shut down. Fitbit bought Pebble, and we haven't seen another Pebble since, which sucks. I love Pebble. Uh, I'm wearing my old Pebble Time Steel right now, and I still enjoy, you know, over a week's worth of battery life. But the Pebble is at the long end of the battery life spectrum. Uh, High-powered watches like my Samsung Gear S2 or your Gear S3 would do well to surpass 48 hours of battery life. Your Apple Watch would be lucky to go past a full day. Remember when they first came out? It was like 18 hours. A watch that only lasts 18 hours. Anyways, uh, with the processors in our watches suffering the efficiency effects of a slowing Moore's Law. By the way, Moore's Law has now been observed to be uh, doubling in CPU power every three years. It used to be every 18 months. Now it's every three years. Um, And the fact that uh, all battery technology is all but stagnated recently, tech companies need to think of something relatively quickly before the early 2020s, as I have discussed in a previous episode. But there may be hope yet with graphene. Graphene is a major buzzword, and for good reason. Graphene is a pretty amazing technology, um, recent development. So let's see how that would affect battery life potentially. As it stands now, gram for gram, a piece of wood actually contains more energy density than even the best batteries. And it goes without saying that no battery technology can hold a flame to hydrocarbons like gasoline. That means for every gram of gasoline, you can get more out of every gram of gasoline than you can get out of every gram of a lithium ion battery. Uh, So that's where graphene comes in. Graphene may help pack in those precious lithium atoms. Right now, the battery in your phone and laptop stores those atoms in a lithium carbide. Think of it like a kitchen sponge. Squeezing Squeezing a sponge makes it more dense. You can fit more sponges into that tiny useless drawer under the sink if you squeeze them in there first, rather than putting them in uncompressed. Graphene could allow us to... Graphene could allow us to compress batteries to fit more stored energy into the same volume of space. In other words, a battery in your phone that's exactly the same size would last twice as long. Okay, without getting bogged down in techno jargon, all you need to understand is that graphene is basically very, very thinly laid out atoms of carbon. In fact, so thin that a sheet of graphene is only the thickness of the carbon atom. It's super thin. If you can stack these super thin lithium soaked, for lack of a better word, sheets together, you'd have an ultra energy dense battery. So to summarize, researchers have found a way to study this potential technology. When you can study something more effectively, it brings about change more quickly. The change that can be ushered in from this research isn't just great for tiny wearables. I mean, that's fun to think about, but just imagine uh, the the, the batteries in electric cars with twice the density you could go twice as far and twice the density is only the tip of the iceberg imagine how much density you can store into these batteries in the same amount of volume as old batteries and imagine if we ever were able to harness uh, all the energy in a lightning strike we have solar panels and wind and geothermal and stuff like that but imagine if we could harness a lightning strike and if we can make batteries all the more dense 
perhaps we can get closer to harvesting a lightning strike. One lightning strike would power a neighborhood for a very, very long time. It's kind of like the holy grail of energy storage. If you just store lightning strikes, then we're good to go. Lightning strikes during the day, lightning strikes at night. It doesn't depend on a whole lot of things. You kind of wish for bad weather for lightning strikes, but you only need it to happen every once in a while so rarely that one strike would last you a very long time between storms. This is where the geek therapy of it all comes in. You can talk about a story about Research being done to, you know, basically double or better the density of batteries. And it gets you on a discussion of now if we could just figure out how to store lightning strikes, then we would really have something to be happy about. Not to say that, you know, improving the energy density of batteries isn't something to be excited about. I just stated the case that it is something to be excited about. How much? Oh, man, I wish I could get Elon Musk on this show. I would talk to him about any ideas, you know, at least set set his brain off on this tangent that you know that he would think about and lose sleep over, uh, thinking about how we can store lightning strikes. He's making these Tesla batteries and these Tesla, stor- Tesla storage banks, and he's doing his thing in, in uh, Australia. Imagine if you could just apply a technology that stores lightning. And I know... A lot of you have been listening for the past minute and just been like, Johnny, storing lightning is so incredibly difficult. And yes, I understand that. I I understand the technical hurdles of storing tens of hundreds of thousands of volts of electricity and amperage that happens almost instantly and using almost that instant dispersal of electricity into storing it, converting it that quick into a storage solution uh, fast charge of, of lithium ion battery packs like when your phone fast charges or your car fast charges 80% in 30 minutes or whatever it is batteries get real hot when you when you charge something even that fast if you fast charge your phone over several minutes you're, it heats up you can feel it so imagine the heat it doesn't take a lot of imagining imagine the heat that would need to be dealt with to store a lightning strike uh, on the way out here, a quick little bit for Audi Central Houston. Audi Central Houston is your one-stop shop for all Audis from the A3 to the R8. The new e-tron is coming out. You can actually see the new e-tron at Audi Central Houston coming up here soon. So make sure you're vi- you go and visit AudiCentralHouston.com to get all the information on that e-tron and where to see it. We'll be right back with more Geek Therapy Radio. We're going to talk about sex and porn and Starbucks. So stick around. <laughs> Welcome to Geek Therapy Radio. I am your mental curator, Johnny Hemberger. Before we dive into the first topic on this episode of Geek Therapy Radio this week, just a quick reminder, of course, to follow, like, and subscribe all the Geek Therapy Radio stuff across Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, all of that good stuff there. Just Google search Geek Therapy Radio and it should come up. Make sure it's Geek Therapy Radio with Johnny Hamburger. If you go on YouTube and just type in Geek Therapy Radio, it'll come up on Twitter, Geek Therapy Radio. Just Do you see this trend here, what I'm getting at? Just search for Geek Therapy Radio and subscribe to the podcast and follow all the social media and YouTube. Let's dive right into the first story this week. Starbucks blocking porn on their Wi-Fi networks. All right, this story begs quite a few questions that I can't get into explicitly due to FCC regulations. And for those of you who only listen to the podcast or watch Geek Therapy Radio on YouTube, yeah, Geek Therapy Radio actually airs on the radio here in Houston, Houston, Texas, on KPRC 950 AM. Uh, That, and I try to keep Geek Therapy Radio as close to PG rated as possible possible so back to starbucks blocking porn sites on their coffee on their coffee shop internet uh connections because i imagine it's probably more than wi-fi but have you ever connected to ethernet at starbucks do they even have that I haven't i haven't utilized starbucks to such a capacity to know if they have ethernet connections in in there anyways apparently starbucks promised to roll this anti-porn thing out in 2016 but i guess it has just taken a while to 
you know, button things up. It's only after pressure from the anti-porn activist group called Enough is Enough that Starbucks has made the final push to roll out its porn blocking technology starting in 2019. Now, Enough is Enough pointed out in their words, and I'm, paraphr- I'm paraphrasing slightly, that Starbucks is more concerned with eliminating plastic straws than they are with protecting children and other patrons who don't want to see porn. Uh... In Starbucks, at least. Now, let's examine their point, especially about kids. You might think that enough is enough is just being a party pooper. But in my opinion, I can certainly understand their point about protecting kids from porn. Now, let's get real for a second. Let's get real, real. Let me start by quoting directly the American College of Pediatricians. The availability and use of pornography has become almost ubiquitous among adults and adolescents. Consumption of pornography is associated with many negative emotional, psychological, and physical health outcomes. These include increased rates of depression, anxiety, acting out in violent behavior, younger age of sexual debut, sexual promiscuity, increased risk of teen pregnancy, and a distorted view of relationships between men and women. I would add homosexual relationships as well but anyways for adults back to their quotes for adults pornography results in an increased likelihood of divorce which is also harmful to children the american college of pediatricians urges healthcare professionals to communicate the risks of pornography use to patients and their families and to offer resources both to protect children from viewing pornography and to treat individuals suffering from its negative effects unquote all righty so You, the individual, are, of course, free to have your own opinion or roll your eyes at data. Plenty of people do that already in the face of demonstrable, uh, demonstrable scientific research. Um, Flat Earth. But the fact remains, without parental guidance, exposure to sex without any context can have severely Uh, can severely damage child development. I promise there are people listening to this. For this example, I will use men who grew up with severely warped expectations of what the opposite sex wants. In a man's case, that a woman is hypnotically desperate to give herself to him. Alternatively, for a young woman to feel like this is what is expected of her. That's the side effects of pornography. Uh, So when a child grows up without any sort of context or framework to bring the role of sex into focus and understanding, it results in a myriad of personal and societal ills, up to and including depression, diminished self-worth that manifests itself professionally, and in many, many cases, yeah, unfortunately, violence. So let's bring back, uh, let's bring back into the context what, did, what the heck did I write here? So let's bring this back into context of Starbucks banning porn sites on their networks. No matter your personal opinion of widely studied data, Starbucks doesn't want to be the new porn stash found under the bucket in the woods behind the neighborhood. And to be quite frank, they don't want the legal liability when your five-year-old points to a screen full of boobies and wieners in one of their coffee shops. So to wrap this up, my overwhelming question in the back of my head and probably yours is who the heck is looking at porn in public? But when I answer, uh, but then I answer my own question because I've seen people, I'll be honest, in my experience, almost exclusively dudes watching porn in public. I've seen it at work. I've seen it at school. I've seen it on public transit. People look at porn with brazen disregard. I know you probably listening right now probably think of examples in your head where you've seen somebody uh watching porn in public uh so even more mind-boggling to me is that they're watching it just to watch it they aren't doing anything about it if you catch my drift in public thank god but i guarantee you some are i just haven't personally seen it Uh, actually i take that back a long time ago at work, I saw someone do it. I was, I walked in on them. It was unfortunate. Holy crap. Holy crap. Uh, maybe I just blocked that out of my memory until I just thought of it now. Uh, anyways. Um, 
Yeah, so people aren't doing it in public. Uh, but I guarantee you some are. Either way, Starbucks wants nothing to do with the controversy. And before you think this infringes on any of your personal rights to do whatever you want, wherever you want, it doesn't. Starbucks is a private enterprise. They can enforce anything they want to in their shops. You know, in Texas, we have open carry of licensed firearms, uh, but HEB can can uh, still ban open carry on their private property. Just like you can do almost whatever you want on your property. You can tell people you can't come into my house if you have a gun on you. You are free to do that. It's your private property. So Starbucks can say you can come in here, but you can't watch porn in here. And we can enforce that you can't watch porn in here because they are a private enterprise. So that was an interesting story. I hope you appreciate it going in. A lot of a lot of this was my opinion, as you can probably tell. And some of you are going to agree with this or disagree with this. But I but like I said, there's data on the ill effects of pornography when it's viewed by young children who have no concept of sex and who have no who who don't get sex put into context so starbucks doesn't want to be a shop that exposes that child to sex out of context and pornography anyways is like it's like a it's like a disney movie when it comes to sex it's unrealistic it's it's like a fairy tale Men with no context will grow up seeing this stuff and think, this is, this is what I expect from women. Because they don't have a dad or a mom or anybody to sit them down and say, and have a real straight talk with them. Just say, look, what you're going to see on here is not reality. So do not base your relationships off it. Do not base what sex is off of it. Um, so if parents would do that, it would help, it would help children grow Sexually, of course, I'm not just become adults. Bottom line is, Starbucks, it doesn't it doesn't want the liability of being the child's first exposure to sex. Uh, that's going to do it for this segment of Geek Therapy Radio. We'll be right back with more, including an interview with Matt Farah about his Lamborghini Countach. That's coming up later on Geek Therapy Radio. Stick around. As of recording this, it is the holidays, which means tis the season for Audi Central Houston and AudiCentralHouston.com. There's an Audi in every budget. Like I've always said, from the A3 to the R8, you're getting all the fuel efficiency, the technology, and the sexiness. And all that can be found at Audi Central Houston and AudiCentralHouston.com. Tell them Geek Therapy Radio sent you. Welcome to Geek Therapy Radio. As I mentioned earlier in the show, I've got Matt Farah on the line here. Matt is a friend of the show. And honestly, just to cut to the chase, Matt, hi, how are you doing? Oh, all's right with the world, Johnny. We are uh, chugging along with the, uh, the podcast, and uh, I'm uh, partway through construction of my collector car storage facility in L.A. We're going to be opening next summer, so awesome. exciting stuff. Getting uh- ready for Radwood this weekend. Awesome. And you know, real quick, I am so freaking jealous of the clever name of your podcast, Watch and Listen. Holy crap. Thank you. Yeah, yeah so- the, watch, the Watch Show has been doing well. You know, we branched out from, from cars into watches. There's a, there's a pretty, uh, you know, logical connection between the two, it's, you know, mechanical timepieces and, yeah. and sports cars. And uh, I think I'm pretty good at naming stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I managed to sit down and if I stare at a piece of paper long enough and write out words, I can figure it out. <laughs> it's, it's like math with words, algebra, but yeah. podcast titles. So uh, I read something from Jay Leno recently. I get Haggerty Magazine because that's who insures the DeLorean. And he mentioned also about he likes looking at motorcycle engines because it's like looking at a fine watch, like looking at the mechanisms yeah. of a watch. So Yeah, that that, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, let's dive right into the meat and potatoes of this segment, Matt. You have recently procured a Lamborghini Countach, so tell me all about that. It's the best thing ever. Um, Yeah, it's an 88 uh, Quattro valve uh, Countach. It's uh, 
it's red with gold wheels. It's like the perfect color, and yeah. you know, very very fortunate to be able to uh, to you know be not only be in a a position financially to be buying something like that, but also um, to to you know find the right car. And yeah. I think that uh, the Countach's are they're pretty rare, and so. Um, if you just woke up one day and decided that you wanted to buy one, um, mm-hmm. the process of, of shopping for one, looking for the right car, doing the due diligence, I mean, it could be uh, a very expensive and time-consuming process. And so, yeah. you know, I'm fortunate that a friend of mine who I know well um, had this car and and, uh, and has owned it for 10 years, and, and we have an extensive history on the car, and... Um, you know, when a car like that comes up for, for sale from a friend and you can kind of bypass uh, a lot of the headaches about trying to go out and seek one out, yeah. um, you know, you're, there's a lot of value in that. Yeah. So uh, I was able to, to buy it from him, and uh, I'm, I'm just super excited. I've been, I've been driving it. It's, it's really, really neat. <laughs> yeah, that's, that is so, like I said, I, I'm very jealous. And like you were saying earlier, you bought it from a close friend. That makes it... So much sweeter, especially, you know, not just for you buying it, but your, for your friend. He knows, like classic cars, we love them. I love my DeLorean. I still have the DeLorean. And if I sold it, I would want to know that, like a puppy, it's going to a yeah. good home. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I, I was, uh, he let me make a video uh, with the car like four years ago. Yeah. Um, which is really neat. You know, I never thought I would have actually been able to buy it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and so when uh, when he he called and asked if if I would help him sell it, help him find a buyer, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I I seized on the opportunity to say, uh, I don't think we need to do that. I know a guy. If I ever want to sell it, uh, if I ever decide to sell it, he has asked for the uh, the right of refusal mm-hmm. to uh, to make a matching offer and buy it back. So, right, right. You know, that's pretty cool. He 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 knows where to find it. He, yeah, uh, he wants it back. Yeah, exactly. So, what I want to do here in this segment with our five minutes or so remaining is I want to kind of play theater of the mind here, give listeners kind of a, a visceral, as much of a visceral connection to the car as they can through you. So, I want you to describe walking, like getting into the car, like pressing the button to get into the car, what the door does, putting your hands on the steering wheel. Just describe yeah. the experience of the car for us. Well, there's not much greater joy than just walking into my garage and seeing it there. It you was know, that it's so visually striking and and low and wide that yeah. you know just to go from the that door of my house into the garage and see it there, you know, even if I'm not going to drive it at that moment, it's hilarious. Yes, just be like, yeah, I cannot believe this thing is sitting in here. It's more shocking you know? than the, than the DeLorean. Well, yeah, I mean, it's the DeLorean, I loved my DeLorean, and yeah. I had a DeLorean, and they, they occupy the same space in the garage, Yeah. Um, but, but even compared to a DeLorean, which is a beautiful car, right. um, you know, the Lamborghini is so extreme, Yeah. Um, and it's, it's really cool, and even especially when I come up to the garage from the outside and open the garage and just see the tail of it with the exhaust pipes and the, yeah. and the wind is real crazy, Yeah. Um, I have a... It actually has remote door actuators, so I have a, I can pop the doors on a remote. Oh, you punk! Which is really cool. <laughs> so you, you pop the door, you know, the door opens for you as you approach. Yeah. Um, when you start it, um, you know, if it's cold, it, it has to. It's got like sixteen quarts of oil, so it has to warm Jeez. up for like four or five minutes before you can drive it you anywhere. Wait, you wait for the needle to come off the peg just a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it, it has a very high idle. Like, when it's ice cold, mm-hmm. when you start it, it idles at, like, 2,000 RPM for, like, four minutes. Wow. Um, and, then it, and then it settles at around 1,500 RPM, which is the normal idle, which is very high by modern standards. And it's a, su- um, it's a super nice cami idle? No, it's very it's smooth. It's just got a, a low, smooth rumble to it. For the V12, um, I guess. It's not cammy like a, like a muscle car at all. It's very smooth. That's a characteristic um, of the V12, isn't it? Yes, V12s are, are very smooth, mm. and, and it is a pretty mild cam in terms of that smoothness. Um, but it just has this, this even low hum, you know, as it yeah. warms up. But it's, it's, it's loud, for sure. Okay. But it's not rough. 
So, um, and, and then I have to take my shoes off to drive it. I, <laughs> I can't, the, the pedal box is very small, so I actually can't drive it with shoes on. Is it pushed over um, to one side? It's a little bit moved inward, although it's not as bad as Ferraris of the period. Mm -hmm. uh, Ferraris are worse. This one is, it's just a small pedal box, but it's not really that offset. Um, and, uh, you know, backing it out of the garage is, is a challenge. you got to yeah. have the door open and lean out of the door. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's a big sill, too, isn't it? It's, it's a, a big what? It's a big door sill, too, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's not very good at going backwards. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't design it to go backwards. Uh, yeah, but, you know, it, um, you know, because it's been idling for so long, you know, folks will hear it. Yeah. Sort of peek their head out and see and see me backing it out and go, Oh my God, you know, and take pictures or whatever. And it's crazy. And, <laughs> yeah. and, um, you know, but, but actually, um, driving it is quite lovely. Um, you know, it, it's it, it, the, the clutch is heavy, but it's not difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the shifter requires it's gated and it's a dog legs shifter. So it does require, um, smooth, deliberate shifts, but yes. it, but it's, um, you know, it's not difficult to drive, really. Yeah. Is is uh, first gear third, down? First is down left, and second gear is where third gear would normally be. Yeah. And Interesting. Reverse is where first goes first. First is normally there's a there's a lockout for reverse, so you don't accidentally shift it into reverse. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, but compared to uh, the the standards of a modern supercar or even a normal modern sports car, it actually has a really beautiful ride. It's not overly stiff mm -hmm. um it rides nicely it has a lot of sidewall on the tires so it's not jarring yeah um you know it's small inside but it's not uncomfortable i i think the seat once you're once you're sitting in it is is reasonably comfortable there's a lot of shoulder room because of those wide sills yeah um you know the forward visibility and the visibility to the sides is fine mm -hmm. um you know the front overhang is not very long so you don't have to really worry about bottoming out on speed bumps the yeah. way you do with a modern, uh, more modern car. Yeah. Um, and although you know it's a little clunky in traffic, um, it's well behaved. You know the radiators are good. It doesn't overheat. It doesn't really get angry at me if I get stuck in traffic. But once you get out on the open road, you know uh, fourth and fifth gear on the highway, mm -hmm. you know it's just it's a beautiful driving experience. Um, it. it it um it rides beautifully it has great power it, it loves to just kind of cruise at 80 miles an hour yeah um it's, like i said it's very it's very smooth it has a very wide power band so yeah. you can you know you don't have to be zinging the thing to redline all the time although you know i mean obviously it's quite enjoyable to wind out the motor it sounds great but you know you can you can shift up at 3000 rpm and just cruise and um it actually has a a reasonably usable trunk mm -hmm. um, behind the engine underneath where the wing is. I mean, it's certainly not big, but I could fit two duffel bags in there or I could fit some groceries in there. Yeah. Um, it has the original Alpine stereo from 1988, right. um, which in 88, that was a, um, that was a nine thousand dollar option in nineteen eighty eight. Wow, CD player. So I got, I got bust out my CDs from high school, you know, and, yep. uh, in your dream car, um, it has, yeah, and it, you know it has air conditioning. Actually, oh. the, the 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 um by far the the potentially worst thing about the car would be, um you know the very tiny windows combined with a very big uh, greenhouse. So mm, yeah, um, if the air conditioning didn't work, I imagine it would be absolutely brutal to drive because it would you just cook. But yeah. as it turns out, the air conditioning does work. And it works well, and the car uh, and the cabin actually stays really, really cold. And unlike when I had my DeLorean, mm -hmm. my DeLorean, the air conditioning worked. Yeah. But when you turned it on, it felt like it sucked, you know, 50% of the engine's power away. <laughs> well, uh, it probably did. It probably did. You yeah. know, the Lamborghini has 450 horsepower. Yeah. And so when you, you know, when you turn the air conditioning on, you know, you can hear the slight change in idle if you're, you know, if you're stopped in traffic or whatever. But, but for the most part, you know, you don't actually notice really a difference in, in performance. I mean, even mm -hmm. if it takes a little bit of the power away, it, it doesn't 
completely ruin the driving experience yeah. the way that it did in, in when I had the DeLorean or when I've had some some other cars. My 911, I, I have an old 911. Yeah. And that has air conditioning. Um, and pretty much you only want to use the air conditioning when you're on the highway because it really changes the response of the engine, yeah. you know, in traffic. Um, and it's a much smaller engine with much less power. But mm -hmm. with the Lamborghini, you know, you can really run the air conditioning all the time. And it's it's fine. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's honestly, you know, a lot of people say they don't drive well. I, I don't know what they're talking about. I think it drives nice. I think it's really cool. <laughs> and, and, and and I think it's, it's I think it's I think it's what you're after too. When people because I've heard that too. And people, you know, it depends what you're after. I like you. I I like that very visceral. You know, like I've said before this very connected connection to the car. Yeah, and and I mean, look, the con the the pedals and the shifter are a little heavy. Reversing it's a little clunky. Parking it is a little nerve-wracking, but the truth is, it, it, it is such a unique experience. I've driven a lot of cars. There's nothing like this thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the reactions you get from other people, you know, there, 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 there's not a lot of cars on the road that have the presence that pulling up somewhere in a Countach has. I'd say you there's know. probably none. I don't even yeah, think yeah. a, a Veyron would pull as much. Yeah, I mean, it, it's because at this point, you know, it, in the 80s, it was obnoxious and over the top, and, you know, people would turn their noses up at you and go, you hit the drug dealer car. <laughs> you know, it's 30 years old now. You're, you're not, you don't have the newest, flashiest thing. You yeah. have, you know, at this point, it's, it's decidedly a classic. It is oh, so absolutely. iconic. You know, it's, it's a design that folks in their... Uh, mid thirties to fifties, mm -hmm. you know, this is the poster car for a pretty wide generation of people. And yeah. because they built it from 74 to 90, you know, 16 years was the production run of the Countach. Yeah. Um, it, it has, it has a wider fan base than most cars. You know, that Porsche yeah. 959 was great. They built it for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. You know, the Ferrari F40, they built for three years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these are icons, but they're icons to a much narrower age range of people than the Countach, which they made for 16 years. Yeah. And, um, and oh, by the way, over those 16 years, they built just under 2,000 Countaches. Yeah. Well, Lamborghini sold 7,000 cars in 2017 alone. Yeah. That's, so it, yeah. It, 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 it's, you know, just over a third of one year's production of Lamborghini spread out over 16 years. You know, yeah. the Countach is, uh, is five times rarer than a Ferrari Testarossa. Yeah. I, I know your time is running short here, but I have two quick questions if you can answer them sure. fairly quick. One, uh, what does the Lambro, the Lambro, the Lambo Lambro. smell like? What's the smell sensation in there? I know that's kind of a weird question, but up uh, but us car guys, we like to, to smell the gasoline or the leather, whatever. Describe that. And then on the quick on the way out, what's what's Joe Rogan rolling in? Uh, the Lambo smells like. Um, <laughs> Oil and old leather. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it does good. have the original leather. It is, it is in nice shape. You know, the car's only got 17,000 miles on it. So, oh, wow. Yeah. O old leather and a, and a hint of motor oil. Uh, <laughs> that's per yeah, for that's, sure. That's perfect. Uh, and uh, Joe has, I think Joe's daily driver is a BMW M5. Mm. Um, he also has two 911s. He's got a 964 uh, RS America, and then a, a 997 GT3 RS. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and then Icon is building him uh, some type of Toyota FJ. I think like I think it's like a Land Cruiser from the late 80s or early 90s. Yeah, I, I yeah. saw you on his podcast recently, and I just wanted to... I, I can't remember if you yeah, went over everything he had. Yeah, yeah it's fun. It's Joe's, he's, he's got a good show. I think I did his show back in like April, but... Yeah. Like three hours and 40 minutes. It was a real marathon. Oh, yeah. I mean, speaking of time, I know your time is, is running out here. So, Matt, thank you so much for being on Geek Therapy Radio. And, and plug away anything again that you want to plug here. Uh, you know, two shows a week at the Smoking Tire, uh, Smoking Tire podcast, Smoking Tire video series. You can find all of that at thesmokingtire.com. Uh, the Watch and Listen podcast about watches is every Wednesday. Uh, just Google Watch and Listen Podcast. It's on iTunes or wherever, but it's also on YouTube. It's a video show. And, uh, 
you have a collector car in West, L West Los Angeles and you're kicking yourself because you've got nowhere to keep it, uh, Westside Collector Car Storage will be opening uh, next summer, uh, July or August. And you can email me, matt at thesmokingtire.com if you want to get on the list for that. That's all. Awesome. awesome. Matt, thank you so much for coming on Geek Therapy Radio. You're welcome, buddy. I got to go. See you later. Cool. Get help with your nutrition, worththeweight.co, W-E-I-G-H-T, worththeweight.co. Welcome back to Geek Therapy Radio. Did you enjoy that interview with Matt Farah? I really need to get to L.A. and meet up with Matt and take a ride in that Lamborghini. Countach, the OG Lambo, other than the Mura. Uh, but the Lambo that really every kid in the 80s and 90s had a picture in 70s, late 70s, had a poster of two things. Farrah Fawcett and maybe Daisy Duke, but definitely the Lamborghini Countach. I'm so stoked that I got to talk to Matt about his about his Lambo. Matt, we're going to set it up. I'm going to come to L.A. Next time I come, I'm sending you a, shooting you a text or something. Got to see that Lambo. Got to make a video. With this last segment of Geek Therapy Radio this week, as I've more recently been prone to do, I used this last segment to kind of run through some geek news. I don't spend any time on one topic like I do in previous segments. We kind of run through the gamut here because I want to appeal to... We're all geeks about something. You know, that's the motto of my show. We're all geeks about something. So in this last segment, I tend to hit topics to try to appeal to the geek in all of us. So let's start out with something that I've seen some people talking about. It's something that I'm not crazy into. And, and I, when I get into this, you're going to say that's kind of sacrilege. But Cowboy Bebop. And I'm sure you may already know where I'm going with this, but maybe you don't. Maybe you're getting this news first. Netflix uh, has announced that they are going to make a live action Cowboy Bebop. Cowboy Bebop is an anime as famous as, if not more famous as, Akira. Uh, Cowboy Bebop is... How, how do I put this? Uh, people... It's like the Bible for some people. It is that important to some people. It's like the Star Wars of anime. I think that's probably a better way to, to kind of put it. It has that type of cult following. Even though, would you call it a cult following like Star Wars... Everybody likes Star Wars. It's like saying Trek, Star Trek has a cult following of Trekkies. No. If damn near everybody and your mom likes Star Trek and Star Wars. My grandmother's 96 years old and she went to see Star Wars when it first came out in the 70s. Not that much of a cult following, but I would say maybe Cowboy Bebop has more of a cult following. Anyways, about this new live action Cowboy Bebop Netflix is working on, it's it's met with mixed mixed commentary my only concern with it is i hope it doesn't suck like the live action remake of death note i am not hugely into a lot of animes i watched bleach like hundreds of episodes of bleach before just was just like all right you're just making stuff to make stuff this is stupid um so i like bleach uh death note is Death Note's my favorite anime, but it's my favorite just story, I think. My, one of my favorite animated stories ever. Just one of my favorite pieces of art ever. How many episodes? 36 episodes? Under 40? It's definitely under 50 episodes. That's the entire thing. It just it tells one story over, I really think it's like 36 or something episodes. Someone, someone type, if you're watching on YouTube, correct me below. Um, but Death Note, when it was adapted to live action was so horrible. It was so horrible. Parts of it were kind of neat, but 99% of it was terrible. Just terrible. So I understand people's worry about a live-action Cowboy Bebop. I personally have reservations about making live-action anything animated. The new Lion King. Why? The new Dumbo. Why? What was wrong with Lion King? Leave it alone. What was wrong with Dumbo? Leave it alone. As if you're going to sit your kid in front of the original Dumbo or the original Lion King and they're going to say, this is stupid. No. 
I understand why Disney's doing it. It's a money grab. It is just a money grab. So I understand that part of it, but just leave it alone. And if they ever... Back to the Future is a live action movie right off the bat. You know, it's not an animation. But the way they remake movies, I'm just talking about remakes in general. I am ruining the day that we see a remake of Back to the Future and it's freaking... Oh, who would it be in there? Uh, it would be... No, oh, gosh, why am I blanking out on the guy from uh, Saturday Night Live who made fun of Dan Crenshaw? Why am I blanking out on his name? But you know who I'm talking about. I'll just say Andy Samberg. That's a different person, but Andy Samberg. I am ruining the day that they remake Back to the Future in its Andy Samberg in a Toyota Prius. The time machine is a Prius. <laughs> Stop messing with movies that were perfectly good in the first place. And Back to the Future still holds up in that case. Don't, please, I'm begging you, Hollywood, please don't mess with Back to the Future. I will actively boycott the studio. I need to see more movies in general. Let's move on to another topic. The Cowboy Bebop is going to get a live action thing. Okay, uh, here's some kind of kind of big news. If you are a content creator on YouTube, and we know that game streaming is very popular, Twitch and all that, Nintendo has a has long since had a vice grip on on using Nintendo footage in YouTube videos or any sort of content. You had to go through this long, arduous process of getting approval, and then if you got approval from Nintendo to feature footage from their games... On your in your YouTube content, you, Nintendo would take thirty percent of the ad revenue generated by the video. Nintendo has just announced that they are doing away with their controversial revenue sharing program. All basically, in a nutshell, all Nintendo wants now is for any crea- creators you can create anything you want using Nintendo. Well, quote unquote, anything you want using Nintendo footage. But you have to do basically two things. You have to name what the footage is, and then you have to add creative input and constructive commentary about it. So if you're going to play the new Smash Brothers, you can't just sit there not talking, doing a gameplay of Smash Brothers. You have to be talking about it. Things you like about it, things you don't like about it. It has to be useful uh, information if you're featuring a video that is talking about one of Nintendo's products. So that's actually kind of... uh, that's kind of a big break. Uh, I know uh, my friend David, who may or may not listen to this episode, I'll tell him to listen to it. We've, we've talked about that way, way long time ago, like episode four or something like that of Geek Therapy Radio of Nintendo's vice grip on any on creative uh, creating content using Nintendo stuff. Oh, here's a cool story. I think this is going to be the last one on the way out. Uh, maybe one or two more. Um Atomic clocks have gotten so precise, a new atomic clock has gotten so precise that, you remember a while back we were talking about uh, gravitational waves, that we could measure gravitational waves? Well now, atomic clocks have gotten so precise that they can detect anomalies in space-time. Distortions in space-time. Did you hear me? Not only now can we detect gravitational waves, but we can detect ripples in space-time. The fabric of time. One second, two seconds. We can detect anomalies. Maybe a supermassive black hole blows up hundreds of thousands, billions of light years away. We can detect that. Hey, that last second of time was slightly shorter or longer than the previous second of time. That's nuts. That's awesome. A lot of people might pass over this story. They might. This is going to be the last the thing we talk about in the Geek Therapy Radio, but a lot of people some people might pass over that story. Either it goes over their heads or whatever, but you don't need to think about it that deeply. All it amounts to is now we can detect disturbances and fluctuations in time. I, my mind is just racing with, with what that could mean, what kind of, my, one of my favorite words, ramifications that could have on you know, potential, the theory of time travel. I'll just say the theory of time travel. Uh, to go the speed of light, you need to do something if, like 99.9% of the speed of light, you need to consume as much energy. Like you can need, need to consume an entire planet of Jupiter every second to propel yourself at nearly the speed of light. Uh, 
that's nuts. So anyways, that's it. That's going to do it for Geek Therapy Radio. I hope you enjoyed this this episode of Geek Therapy Radio. Make sure you go to all my friends at Kung Fu Saloon, kungfusaloon.com, where you can eat. I say eat beer if it's cold enough. You can drink beer, eat great food, play great arcade games. Uh, Kung Fu Saloon, kungfusaloon.com. Audi Central Houston, audicentralhouston.com. Get your Audi on. And uh, I think that's going to be it for this episode of Geek Therapy Radio. Thanks for sticking with me. Like, follow, subscribe, Geek Therapy Radio across all social media and YouTube, and I will see you next time.